So this is our first virtual grand round. It's called A New Normal for the Clinician's Third Hand, Stethoscope Hygiene and Infection Prevention. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Frank Peacock. Um, he's the author for this new paper in the American Journal for Infection Control under APIC. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get started. By the way, my name is uh, Anthony Pham. I am the Stethoscope Hygiene Communications Lead for Aseptoscope. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick intro of our company. So we provide infection protection for a clinician and patient with novel aseptic solutions. Um, if you're a clinician, we're dedicated to making infection control fast and simple. If you're a patient, we are here to protect you and we're driven to bring innovative and validated solutions that lower the risk of contamination and infection in healthcare systems. And the reason we started these virtual grand rounds is uh, for the clinician's third hand, the stethoscope. Uh, we've just lately, um, like in the past decade, we've as a, as a people, we've learned um, a lot of important information about the stethoscope as a vector um, in the clinician's third hand here, the stethoscope. Um, and the reason it's called that is because of what you see on the screen. It's uh, the path pathogen and volume uh, and diversity of the stethoscope diaphragm is very similar, extremely similar to what you find on the fingertips, which as we all know are super important vector transmission of pathogens in the healthcare setting. Um, with patient contact, the patient, um, the stethoscope diaphragm often comes into physical contact with the patient just as the hands do. And for those reasons, it's a really big transmission vector and is therefore considered um, the clinician third hand. Uh, throughout this presentation, we're going to be doing some uh, polling questions, uh, just a fun little activity for you guys to uh, listen in on or join in on. Um, completely anonymous, so feel free to uh, answer truthfully and honestly. We we won't be uh, hunting anyone down for their answers. And we'll just do uh, start with the practice right here. Um, so I'm going to open up, open up the first poll question. And you should see it on your screen. Go ahead and answer that. So first poll question is, does your facility have written protocols for stethoscope hygiene? Yes, no, you may have protocols on non-critical instruments, or if you're unsure, go ahead and put NA. And everyone who just joined, we're just, uh, I just introduced that we'll be doing a couple of polls throughout the presentation and you should see a poll on your screen. Go ahead and answer that real quick. Uh, I'll give it 10 more seconds and we'll close it out. All right. And I'm sharing the results now and, um, so we got a couple yeses, some no's. Um, one person uh, has some non-critical protocols, but a lot of people are unsure. And this is uh, kind of what we expected is because, you know, stethoscope hygiene is not yet um, into the spotlight as hand hygiene is. And that's eventually what we'd like to have it become. Okay, and then with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the speaker, the main speaker for this presentation, uh, Dr. Frank Peacock. He is the Chief Medical Officer of Aseptoscope and co-founder. He's also also the Professor of Research, um, Research Director and Vice Chair for Research at the Baylor College of Medicine. Um, he's published over 600 publications. He's a two-time winner of the Best Research Paper of the Year Award from the American College of Emergency Physicians, and he's a recipient of the 2019 uh, Ray Barr Award for the excellence from the American College of Cardiology. He's the primary author of today's topic, the newly published AJIC article, uh, New Normal for the Clinician's Third Hand, Stethoscope Hygiene and Infection Prevention. Uh, with that, Frank, I'll pass it over to you. Go ahead and share your screen. All righty. Thank you, Anthony, and uh, we will get started. So I'm gonna have to catch up with you on the slides, it looks like. Are you seeing the right one now? Uh, the other one, Frank, and it's gonna be slide eight. Okay, so are you on slide eight now when I did that? Uh, one more. Okay, good. So let's get started. So this is the article that Anthony is talking about. This came out in AJIC, the American Journal of Infection Control. It's one of the major infection control journals on the planet. Um, and, and what this was is we put a group of people, and you can see all their pictures there, uh, into a room and talked about the importance of stethoscope hygiene. This was a, 
uh, biased group. It's a bunch of oncology physicians. This is not your average doc, so they see sicker patients. And, and honestly, they're more fragile. Uh, Roy Chamali is from uh, MD Anderson, continuously rated the number one cancer hospital on the globe by U.S. Newton Report. Um, Zineb Shaid is from uh, Memorial Sloan Current. Katerina, everyone's heard of that one. Sanji Deadwall uh, is from the City of Hope, and Francesca Torriani is from UC San Diego. So these are some really important places and important people. And, and the rest of the conversation is just going to be about what we talked about in that room. This one here, healthcare acquired infections, you all know this. We are harped to death about this. Uh, it, it is one of the, the greatest problems that we have in medicine. It's uh, We're not winning the war. There are new bugs coming that have no antibiotics that work for them. I mean, that's a really pro big problem. And it costs us a lot of money and kills a lot of people. That's why I have to wash my hands 50 times a day when I work in the ER. We have uh, hygiene police who walk around and check my hands, make sure I wash them. And if I don't, I get a bad sticker. And you get too many of those and they fire you. And Anthony told you the stethoscope has the exact same bugs as the hand, except nobody cares about that. You can rub it over as many people as you want. And it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's just insanity how we've gotten there. If you want to put this into context, it's a, we lose about 250 people a day for what's perceived to be reversible infections. It's equivalent to crashing a jet. And a jet in Pakistan goes down. We all hear about it, but we kill 250 people a day in our hospitals, and we just sort of ignore it because we think it's a standard of care, and it's not. And then when you put that into the cancer environment, it gets even worse because these are people who are neutropenic, who have uh, bad disease, their ability to fight infections don't doesn't work very well. Oh, and then I, then I say that we made it more complicated. So we started breeding bugs that are tougher, MDROs, multiple drug-resistant organisms that are particularly um, difficult to manage, and they are particularly found in hemonc wards. So this is the place where it's the most greatest challenge. Everyone heard of C. diff. We see C. diff all the time. Uh, the, the part that I don't that I think escapes most people is they can live on your stethoscope for a year. That's from the CDC, not from me. Uh, they are not killed by alcohol. Um, and they, we spend an estimated billion dollars a year on C. diff. And where do you get C. diff? Well, you get in a hospital. You don't get any place else. I mean, you can get it when you take antibiotics at home, but most people get it in the hospital. So here is a problem, and it lives on your stethoscope. Um, this is data I got from the CDC website. The citation is the article, but it's really from the CDC. You can see the costs over there, $4.8 billion a year. And some of them are just scary. C. diff is a, a billion. But crab, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter doesn't have a cure. If, if you get this bug, very few antibiotics work for it. So we're in 1940, you got it in your hand. You know what we did in 1940? You got a bad infection in your hand, we cut it off. And that's what we're the pipeline we're looking down to right now if this continues. If we if we keep growing bugs that we have no antibiotic control with, what are we going to do? And we're going to be in a bad spot. So uh, they're bad, and they're particularly bad in immunocompromised patients, as you would expect. When you uh, have an inability to fight disease and we give you a multi-drug resistant organism, uh, we, we've not made it very good. So this is the next poll question. I'm going to ask you to answer it, and then I'm going to continue on, and a couple of slides will stop and pick it up. But I, want, um, I don't want to stop the pace of this while you figure out what button to push. Um, so here's the question. Oh, I get to answer it too? Excellent. Uh, thank you. I didn't think I got the answer. Anyway, wiping. So how do you currently practice stethoscope hygiene? Do you do it at all? Uh, do you wipe it down with alcohol? Does a single patient use stethoscopes? Do you do both? Do you do something different? And Anthony, we should have had an answer that says, I don't do anything because that's the honest to God, most truthful answer. Uh, so oops. Anthony, I can't. It, oh, there we go. So here is the facts of the matter is that the dirty secrets of the hospital medicine is stethoscopes are covered with bugs and nobody cleans them. And I'll show you the data on this. So this is a study done by Zachary, and this was, was relatively recently. Uh, they went in there and they uh, cultured gloves and gowns and stethoscopes uh, to see what would happen. And they were specifically doing this in patients who were known to have vancomycin resistant enterococca. Uh, VRA, a particularly nasty multi-drug resistant organism to see what would happen to them. Uh, we didn't get the answer to the last one, or did we, Anthony? What was the answer to the last poll? Here we go. All right, so a third, wipe it down with alcohol, and that's great unless you have C. diff. Uh, single pa patient use stethoscopes. Nobody uses them. They're terrible anyway. They're like a toy. Uh, I prefer not to. Or they do some combination of the above, or they do something else. Uh, that's interesting. Okay. 
I'm surprised that nobody uses single patient use stethoscopes. Um, I don't support them in the slightest, but I thought they were more commonly used than they seem to be. So this is the, back to the Zachary study. VRE was isolated in 67% of the patients. So if you go into a patient's room and you come out, you have VRE on you. It's on your jacket. It's on your stethoscope. And if you throw away your jacket because you're wearing a gown, that's great. But And you wash your hands. But what do you do with your stethoscope? A third of the stethoscopes had VRE on them. VRE is bad. You don't want vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. But if you examine the patient, you carry it out with them on your stethoscope. So the idea you're not going to do something with your stethoscope is crazy. This is MRSA. I don't know I, if I practice a day, I didn't see it. I see it all the time, every shift. There's always somebody who's got an abscess. It looks like this lady's leg over there. And, you know, we go through the routine of culture and put her on antibiotics. Um, but if you listen to her with your stethoscope, it's on your stethoscope. And this is a study where they took it and they put the stethoscope and just pushed it on the agar plate. And you can see the MRSA growing on it uh, in the circle of the diaphragm, which is how it works. So uh, this next one is C. diff. Now, that lady, the picture there, that is uh, Peggy Lilith. Uh, she went into the hospital and died like two weeks later. Her son started the, the C. diff foundation, the Peggy, Lil Peggy Lilith Foundation. We spend something estimated uh, on the, a billion a year on the 39,000 cases uh, that kill people every year. Uh, it's estimated we have a half a million cases a year in the United States. It's a real problem. And the reason it's a real problem is it lasts for a long time on surfaces and it's not killed by alcohol. So unless you're using a K drug, a, a K antiseptic, that's the peroxide-based antiseptics, you're not doing anything with your alcohol swab. Um, and so this is from Leicester Hospital in uh, London. Uh, they went around 61 stethoscopes from the docks and to see what would happen. And then they cultured them and it was isolated on 5%. One in every 20 had C. diff on their stethoscope. That's pretty scary because if it's one in 20 and your doctor's going to listen to you, what do you think? Oh, are you willing to bet on that? It's like, that's not cool. So it's about 5% of stethoscopes will have it. This was a study by Smith. 200 stethoscopes, four hospitals went through. 83% were infected. These are the bugs. Not all of them are path pathogenic. Um, you know, staph epi is considered pretty much non-pathogenic. But there are bugs of every species on these stethoscopes. So not... Uh, very reassuring at all. And so this is where we are. Is we wash our hands. We wash our hands 50 times a day. Most doctors do not wash their stethoscopes. And if they did, is, would it work? And I think that's a real question. So were you aware that cleaning with alcohol between patients doesn't kill C. diff? Yeah, I was, but I've been studying this stuff for a while. Let's see what the poll says in a minute here. So this is uh, two studies that we did. I did one of them and Alan Mizell did the other. We went around and we just watched what doctors did. How often do you clean your stethoscope? And what we learned uh, at Ben Tab, which is my county hospital, is that nobody really cleans their stethoscope ever. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, about 4% clean it with CDC guidelines. And that was in 400 patients. And Alan Mizell did it in his, his hospital and found same numbers. Exactly. So when doctors tell you they're cleaning their stethoscope, maybe they are, but Probably not because nobody in these studies did it. This is a study we did where we asked doctors, did you clean your stethoscope? And 86% said, oh, yes, I did. So we cultured it immediately. It's called ambush study. 91% of the stethoscopes had bugs on them. So I'm not going to call them liars. If they said they um, cleaned their stethoscope, I'm assuming they did. But the reality is if they said they cleaned their stethoscope and 91% of the time it still had bugs on it, that means cleaning your stethoscope doesn't work, which is pretty much what we believe. Um, is that cleaning your stethoscope does not work. We can clean it all afternoon. So the next one, oh, here's the answer to that one. Oh, two thirds of people realize that alcohol doesn't work. A third did not. So that's the message on that poll was that alcohol doesn't kill C. diff. You can wash it all afternoon and it's just the spores are not affected by it. So I guess we're probably going to um, Gild the lily on this one. Were you aware that cleaning alcohol between patients will not remove C. diff and other pathogens? And so, well, let's focus on the other pathogens, um, whether that would happen. So this is a study that was done with mannequins and they had uh, three simulation exams and you went in there and you would examine a patient on one um, simulation man, then go to the next simulation man and examine that one and then culture the second simulation man to see if there were bugs transferred. And this is a surrogate they used. They didn't use pathogens. They used coliform mosaic virus, 
bacteriophage, non-toxigenic C. diff spores and tracer. And, but this is the scary part. And what you see there is, yeah, the bugs were transferred from patient to patient. That we knew. But if you look at the light, I don't know, what is that, teal color on those graphs, about 10% of the time, C. diff was transferred, even if they washed their stethoscope. So once again, washing your stethoscope didn't get it done. You could be a diligent physician 86% of the time and, and wash your stethoscope, and it doesn't matter. You still end up with a 10% transfer of C. diff and other MDROs. This is a study that's addressed that. They went and cultured bacteria, neck did this before uh, and after cleaning. And what they found out is it didn't really work. And the magic number over there is in red. And 28% of the time, even after cleaning with 65% alcohol, the stethoscope still had pathogens on it. So it, unfortunately, it doesn't work to clean your stethoscope. You can clean it. Most people don't clean it. But if you do clean it, unfortunately, it will maintain a level of infectivity that is unacceptable. 10% uh, if they got, if you have C. diff, and um, we don't really know for crab and all those other drugs, multidrug resistant organisms, the specific pathogen um, transfer rate, but it's going to be at least C. diff. Um, so it's a pretty scary thing. This is the next scary thing is the idea that we're going to use alcohol to clean this. And we've been doing this for a decade now, at least in my hospital. I have these sanitizers everywhere. I'm washing my hands all the time. My hands are dry and cracking, but <clears throat> we are cleaning our hands, not our stethoscopes. But even if you do, uh, this is the scary part, is over the decades, um, the bacteria population is becoming resistant to alcohol. And this is what happens with um, multidrug resistant uh, acinid or bomini, one of the bad ones, is that if you give them low concentrations of alcohol, you actually stimulate them to grow faster. So not only do you not sterilize your stethoscope, you make them have more bacteria on it. Uh, this is a frightening piece that is becoming more and more common, which would you be expected? We've got antibiotic resistance. Why wouldn't there be uh, alcohol resistance? So this is the next question. Well, one of the things that hospitals do is single pa patient stethoscope. How many people do that? And are you satisfied with that? Um, I'll let you answer. You all answer those. Uh, I know how I feel about them. This is a study we did with a high fidelity stethoscope and a disposable stethoscope. On Sinman, we ran about 800 auscultations through here. This is Surathi Kalra's paper that he published um, in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. And what they found out was this, is that with a barrier, there never was a, an error. The error rate was zero with a quality stethoscope. The error rate was zero with a, with a barrier and a quality stethoscope. The error rate with a disposable stethoscope was 10.9%. Number needed to harm 10. So every 10 patients, you miss the diagnosis. You want to be the 10th patient? Use a, use a disposable stethoscope. These things are toys. They should not be allowed on the market. There's nothing in, in medicine that allows a 1 in 10 error rate. So if you're satisfied, then nobody's satisfied. <laughs> I'd like to know if you're neutral. Um, but uh, I will tell you that uh, these things are toys. They don't work. You should have a different uh, approach to stethoscope hygiene. The other problem is, is that the, these single-use stethoscopes are infected themselves. They have bugs on them. This is a study where they cultured the earpieces. Now, I've never cleaned the earpiece on my stethoscope, and I've never cleaned the earpiece on a disposable stethoscope. But if you did, you'd find that 17% had a bug on it. And these are scary bugs, Staph aureus, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, things you don't want in your ears. So when somebody asks if they can share my stethoscope, you know what, I look at them, I give them a really dirty look, and I say, no, there's not a chance. Um, so that, uh, because I don't want to share your bugs. I mean, I may like you. I may like you a lot, but I still want to share your bugs. Come on, man. Uh, this is 24 ICU stethoscopes before and after cleaning, if you ever did clean them. And still, MRSA persists in about a 5% rate. So you can clean all day. It just isn't going to work. You need to have your own stethoscope. You need to have a barrier on it because we know that alcohol is not working. So alcohol is not an answer. Disposable barriers is not an answer. So what's that do? Do you have... Uh, Currently, quality initiative issues, uh, initiatives that might include stethoscope hygiene. Well, that'll be really interesting. All right, we'll see what you all say to that. So this is the third hand. Um, this is a picture of Stuart Kipper. This is the way most of us dress. Gloves and masks and gowns, and our stethoscope hangs there. So the idea that we can continue to do this is probably not appropriate. This is really a much superior answer. There's a barrier there. Um, there is no... Uh, transmission through it. It doesn't interfere with the acoustics of the stethoscope. It's a single use, goes in the garbage. So um, I'll show you the data behind that right now. Uh, first, we'll see if you have initiatives at your hospital. 
a third no, a third don't know, and a third are unsure. So certainly not yes. Uh, nobody has a yes to that question, so, which uh, I hope we change that one of these days. Okay. This is a section on are acceptic barriers effective? And so what we did is we took um, a bunch of nasty bugs and stuck them on a stethoscope. And it was from saliva and stool and sputum and urine. I don't know. I don't have those in my freezer, but I know an infectious disease guy who did. So that's what we did. We put them on the stethoscope and we punched, put it into the incubator and left it there for a week. And every couple hours, we pulled it out and cultured it again. And the ones with barriers on it, um, this is the methodology. The ones with barriers on it were absolutely sterile. That's the B plus mark you see there, barriers. No, no bugs on the barriers. The ones without bigger barriers were covered with stool and urine and pus and nasty stuff. So, and you're not supposed to use the barriers for a week, but if you did, they work, they are absolutely impervious for a week. So a single use disposable barrier will give your patient a septic contact every single time. And that's nothing in the marketplace. Uh, nothing in the science has ever been able to do that before. We also did it with C. diff. C. diff is particularly bad. Uh, same study, got a bunch of stethoscopes, put a bunch of C. diff on them, put it in the incubator. We have to go into anaerobic incubator and pull them out every 15 minutes and look at them over for the next couple of days. And the C. diff, nothing gets through, but there is C. diff on your barrier, on your stethoscope if you don't have a barrier uh, consistently again. This is the six centers who got the barrier system initially uh, for use. And I'm gonna just talk about their experiences so you can understand the implications of this. Everybody in those centers who used the barrier got this case report or this uh, questionnaire and answered it. it. Takes about a minute. They did it on an iPad and we just look at the data and this is what the data shows. How did you find this stethoscope barrier to be easy, uh, very easy, easy, challenging, difficult, very difficult? And you can see that 93% of the time, pe people who didn't get any teaching just walked up to and used it, found it easy or very easy. So it's really easy to provide an aseptic contact to your patient. And what did they rate it over uh, the disposable stethoscope? And everybody said it's at least slightly or significantly improved. Nine people thought it was no impact. Uh, I'd like to check their hearing. But, uh, but that's this is what the, the uh, science shows. And on workflow, and because if you have something, if you tell every doctor they got to wash their stethoscope for 60 seconds between patient contacts, they won't do it. This is what the CDC rules say, by the way, is you're supposed to wash it for 60 seconds between every patient. Um, and so, because that's so disruptive to your workflow, nobody will do it. It's not happening. But this, which takes a second, it, it is rated as significantly improving, slightly improving, or having no impact on workflow in 95% of the users. 95% will be leave that it will improve stethoscope hygiene. So we asked them, what's the probability of your stethoscope hygiene being better? And they said, well, a lot better because I'll actually do this. I'm not going to wash my stethoscope 60 seconds between patients, but I'll put on a barrier for every patient. And they believe also, because we're not spreading multi-drug resistant organisms around, it will improve patient safety. So this is where it all came to do. These are the attributes that uh, of the different strategies that we have. So you can see uh, isopropyl alcohol wipes there. They're certainly not rapid. They don't work all the time. They do transfer patients between, uh, do allow transfer of bugs between pa patients. Um, they're, they are expensive. That is an advantage, um, but there's no way to monitor them. There's no, uh, they might uh, eat your diaphragm and they certainly contribute to uh, antibiotic resistance as all alcohol is. If you single use stethoscopes, well, they're not cheap. They're about 350 each. Um, they provide bugs to spread between doctors and, and nurses. They, so they are transferring pathogens between staff. Um, and you can't monitor with them. There's nothing to do with that. Uh, they probably do not increase the evidence of resi multidrug resistant population. But if you look at the touch free barrier, they're rapid, they're cheap, they're always sterile, they don't contribute to. Uh, antibiotic resistance uh, that you can monitor them. They have a digital monitoring so you can see if people are using them uh, so, and they don't mess with auscultation. So in the world of options <clears throat> to be most effective, uh, most efficient, uh, it cer certainly seems that the barrier systems in the, in the ahead. There's a Stuart using the barrier again up there. That's exactly how it works. Um, so it's a single use membrane that goes on your stethoscope bear, uh, diaphragm. It goes in the diaphragm because that's where the bugs are. People ask me, well, why didn't it go on the tubing? The answer is because there's really not any bugs and patient contact on the tubing. The majority are on your fingers and the barrier of the stethoscope. So those are the places that should be covered. Uh, 
it's like your elbows. I don't mess with my elbows because uh, my elbows don't touch patients. I don't mess with the uh, tubing of the stethoscope because it doesn't touch the patient. It's the diaphragm. The clean set has 420 single use covers inside of it. So you drop it in there and depends on your use. In my ER, it, they last about a week. Uh, you know, in a clinic where you're seeing, you know, five or 10 patients a day, they'd last for a month or so. It just depends on the usage. And that's the touch free dispenser, uh, which is really the secret sauce. If you have to touch them and handle it with your hand, then the problem is the finger trip bugs just got back on your stethoscope. So the and you just contaminate your stuff your hand with the dirty stethoscope. So the objective is to have a non-touch solution so that you can listen to the patient, not give them the bugs, and then throw the throw the dirty part away. So uh, where do you think these future applications for touch-free barriers might have best application? Stethoscopes, ultrasound probes. Um, hands or all of the above and one of the crazy things is when i go to my er and i want to get a glove out i reach into a box with 100 gloves i pull one out then i snort on my hand and put on the gloves and you wonder was that really clean and you don't know the answer to that all righty so i think i'm winding down here um anthony if we could answer that last question just to find out what people think where um touch free berries should go next all of the above. Yeah, I like uh, ultrasound probes. That's another challenge in my hospital because we, uh, uh, I get notes at least once a month because the the director of the ultrasound fellowship is mad because somebody left blood on the on the ultrasound probe. It's like, that's pretty gross. Wouldn't want somebody else's blood rubbing on me either. And the hands are another big challenge. We see all this coming. Okay, um, I'm going to say thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. Anthony, I don't know if you want to do questions or how you want to run this. I'll turn this back to you though. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Um, wonderful presentation. A lot of really important information on Stethoscope Hygiene. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us on our first virtual grand round for the clinician's third hand. Um, if you have any questions regarding the clinical data that Frank shared, please feel free to reach out to him. Um, you can also ask in the chat or um, unmute your mic at this moment. Let me just give you that permission. Uh, you can unmute your mic at this moment. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, you could also email Dr. Frank at the um, email listed on the screen. Um, again, this was his presentation going over the clinical findings of the AJIC article, the uh, new normal for the clinician third hand. And we do have actually a free access link for that. That'll That's valid until February 22nd. I'm going to put that link in the meeting chat for you all. Feel free to access it, give it a read through if you'd like to revisit any of the information that he mentioned. If I can say one thing, um, and I'm going to spill some beans here we have an annals of internal medicine article coming out uh, it was designed similar to this one we uh, put a bunch of docs in a room and said what do you think about the uh, future of alcohol resistance to our current strategies uh, it's a pretty frightening thing when you think about multi-drug drug resistant organisms we have them now and then we're going to make it where they're alcohol resistant and what is that going to do to the Perel world it's going to go in the tank. That's what that means. And so we've got to come up with strategies that are going to allow us to prevent this future catastrophe from happening. And so this is the next article that's going to come out, I think in April or May, they said, um, will be addressing the, the challenge of our changing world of alcohol resistance and multidrug resistant organisms. Thank you, Frank.